The next case on the docket is Herbst v. Herbst. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Peter Miro. Pleased to be here today and have represented Nikki Herbst, the appellant, from uh, the beginning in this case throughout the course of the trial and up through today. I would like to uh, hold five minutes for rebuttal. We're here seeking a reversal of Judge Ramsberger's order on two grounds. Uh, number one, related to the termination of alimony and number two related to the setting off of attorney's fees against an alleged overpayment of uh, alimony. I digress for a minute to say that it's almost unfair to Judge Ramsberger that he did not have the benefit of the Taylor case that came out after he entered his order and before this oral argument today, because I think if he had, uh, that the shoe would be on the other foot and that we'd be here today as an appellee as opposed to appellant. Of course, we'll argue that case in a little bit. Um, in August of 2009, after a long-term marriage and, and four children, the parties, after three mediations, entered into an agreement uh, under the terms of which the husband was to pay $4,500 a month permanent periodic alimony, and the specific language of the agreement was that it was continuing for the life uh, of the um, petitioner versus respondent. We'll get into that in a minute, but the wife um, and the parties agreed that this alimony is non Modifiable. And the That's, cases seem to indicate that maybe the agreement should have gone a step further and make clear that in the event of remarriage that it was still non-modifiable. I mean, that's a, the way I read this. I mean, basically, the, your argument is it was in the stipulation, it was non-modifiable, you know, remarriage shouldn't change that. The cases seem to indicate you should have gone farther and said more, so why don't you address that point? Yes, sir, sure. Well. I think the, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I hope that nobody is thrown in any way by this, uh, the Scrivener's error in the case related to the respondent versus the petitioner. That really is not an issue before the court. There's no issue whatsoever but that he was to pay her and it was $4,500 a month. That was raised in the brief. I just want to make it clear that that has nothing to do with the issues before the court today. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, Judge Morris, you very uh, accurately state that one of the issues that was argued before the trial court and um, argued in the brief uh, is that the parties could have done more with regard to how they uh, categorize this alimony. Everybody non says that in hindsight, don't they? Yes, sir. Right. Non-terminable versus non-modifiable. Uh, non, um, you could have said this agreement is non-modifiable and non-terminable. You could say that this agreement, uh, under the terms of this agreement, uh, it doesn't cease for whatever reason, and I say cease because that's the word that the Taylor case used uh, in its very recent opinion related to this. But the bottom line is that these parties forged this agreement during the course of three mediations specifically stated that the termination provisions was only one thing, and that is the death of the wife, and they specifically made it non-modifiable. Now, I submit to the court that 95, if not 100%, of every case you all get before you related to uh, alimony has this language in it. Um, <clears throat> this alimony ceases upon the death of the petitioner, the death of the wife, or the remarriage of the wife, whichever shall first occur. The party specifically chose, for whatever reason, not to include that language, but instead substituted for that language this my alimony is non-modifiable. Does it I make any difference whether they were counseled or not at this mediation when they drafted it? I understand the mis misplacement of names and things like yes, that, sir. but we have $4,500 a month on its face. It could be a lump sum. Sure. Yeah, no, it the number, uh, in answer to your question, Honor, no, it doesn't. Legally, it makes no difference whether they did or they didn't have counsel. Um, but in addition to that, the $4,500 a month figure is a complete red herring in that the record will reflect that throughout the course of this case that that was uh, uh, specifically the deal. There was, and Judge Ramsberger references, references it specifically in his first order on the motion to dismiss. There has never been an argument ever, including in the brief, that this was anything other than the husband to pay the wife $4,500 a month. In addition, it was specifically, there was both argument and testimony related to the fact that that's what he did that he did in fact pay her that money monthly. Now he didn't pay it 
Rarely did he pay the exact 4,500. He took all kinds of credits and did this, that, and the other things that he probably shouldn't have done, but the judge gave him credit for most of them. But yet Judge Ramsberger found it ambiguous. Good, good. To the point where he would allow parole evidence. Yes, sir. Good, and good. you contend good. that was error. No, I do not. Okay. I don't contend that was error. I, I, you have to know the background to that. He, that in his first order on the motion to dismiss an interlocutory order, um, and I understand why he did it. Um, the my main case that we argued at the motion to dismiss was the Porter case, which is in the brief. A uh, pretty neat case where they say the alimony can't terminate unless the parties remarry, doesn't terminate unless the parties remarry each other. And the wife remarried and they said it doesn't terminate. In the Porter case, Judge Zimmer, in a concurring opinion, said we don't really know whether this alimony was for support or was a part of property settlement. And so in the original uh, ruling by Judge Ramsberger on the motion to dismiss, once again an interlocutory order, he found that be for that reason that there might need to be parole testimony on that issue. Was it support or was it property settlement? That later was completely resolved by agreeing that there's no issue before this court today or ever that this was other than support alimony. And that's specifically in the judge's order that this was support alimony. Interestingly, the judge took parole evidence or he took testimony from the parties as to what they intended. And the wife, the former wife, doesn't really testify that there was ever for any consideration of what would happen on remarriage. The former husband basically says, I don't remember much of anything other than I've got an agreement and, and he seems to say he doesn't really recall, he was stressed out, whatever the, the situation was. Yes, sir. What I'm concerned about, uh, and the Taylor case certainly helps your position, but you have a statute that says that alimony will terminate under these circumstances and the case law says that in order to avoid that happening, you have to expressly agree to the contrary. Now, I understand your argument as well, life means life, and that's an expression of uh, contrary intent, and yet it only addresses one of the two parts of the statute, and, and at least I think a legitimate argument by the appellee is, well, if they wanted to address both components of the statute, they should have said that. Absolutely, and, and where there's two different uh, issues on that, and that number one would be um, does this court find uh, reason to disagree, as you certainly can, with the Taylor decision? The Taylor decision is black and white on point in this case. There, I, I've tried. You say the statute isn't as important as the agreement of the party. And it's black and white. It's it's a bridge the gap alimony, but uh, the statute that terminates bridge the gap alimony, the wording is exactly the same. This alimony terminates upon the remarriage of the party, you know, of the person receiving alimony. Both statutes are identical. The facts are identical. There is no way for, in my humble opinion, for this court uh, to distinguish Taylor from this case. In Taylor, the judge said, the judges said in a unanimous, you know, three judge uh, panel opinion that non-modifiable, agreed upon by the parties, means that the alimony does not cease, period, upon remarriage unless you expressly intend that it does. In other words, they put the burden completely on the other side. And they said that the agreement entered into by the parties freely and voluntarily that does things that the court couldn't do controls and governs. And Judge Ramsberger, again, didn't have the benefit of the case and, I, and, and definitely would have ruled uh, uh, to the contrary from my review of this case, specifically said the statute governs, not the agreement. And it terminates as a matter of law, regardless of using the words non-modifiable. There's not no component to it. And I don't think Judge Ramsberger uh, specifically said this, but it, it seems to flow from his discussion. Isn't he ultimately saying the parties didn't have a meeting of the minds on what would happen on remarriage? Well, uh, no, sir. In my opinion, that's not what he, what he said. What he said is that he did not find there to be any factual dispute. You know, there are no findings on any factual dispute. What he said was that because the statute terminates it as a matter of law, that unless 
not a matter of there being a meeting of minds. Unless you do have a specific provision to the contrary, th then it, it, it terminates as a matter of law. And I guess what you're saying is that would have then required the parties to have drafted that language. Well, you, you've been practicing law a long time, and we all understand that parties are presumed to know what the law says. Right. And so if the parties don't address the issue, does the marital settlement agreement reflect a meeting of the minds on what happens upon either party's remarriage? <clears throat> you mean as, as a matter of law, what happens? Well, I th again, the Taylor case says it, it does. The Taylor case specifically says non-modifiable means non-modifiable, non-terminable, not doesn't cease. And the other argument on the other side of that is that you could have included and made it clear. Well, as I've said before, virtually every agreement does deal with that, and it deals with it from the other's pers perspective, and that is it says it does terminate on remarriage or the death of either party. That language was replaced by non-modifiable. Now, you also could put, you, I mean, you, you could put in there, this does not terminate on remarriage. You, you could say that. There's no doubt. There's also a lot of other things you could say. The bottom line here is, does non-modifiable mean non-terminable as well? And there is no factual dispute. There is no parole evidence that's relevant at all to that issue. Matter of fact, the parole evidence, as you said, is meaningless in this case. But the argument that they make on parole evidence is that this gentleman can cause a, an ambiguous agreement by saying, uh, I didn't think that alimony terminated on remarriage. Well, that's a, you can't have a legal conclusion, create an ambiguity. So in this, this case is on all fours with, with Taylor. And there, that three judge panel's argument was, and I completely agree with it, is that when two parties say non-modifiable, what does that mean? Non-modifiable means not changeable. You can't change it. You know, you, reasonable people look at that kind of an agreement, they're not going to have this, uh, this argument in their mind with regard to should we include non-cessation, non-terminable, non-increase, non-decrease. Non-modifiable is non-changeable. And in addition, they add a termination provision, specifically the death of the wife. And they secure that by, by life insurance. Mm -hmm. So this court is, is, is in a position on, on this issue of either accepting that Taylor opinion, which the, 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 the logic behind it is so good. They say, number one, people should be able to reach their, their own agreement. Number two, people can reach agreements that are totally different than what the judge could do. For example, and they give, they give examples in there, you can agree that alimony continues past death and is, is, can be paid by the estate. You can agree that child support continues past the age of majority. And these people agreed that an otherwise terminable and modifiable agreement <clears throat> per law or whatever cannot be modified well, or changed. Let me ask you, as you bring it up. Yes, sir. If he were to die, is your interpretation of the agreement that she still gets it from his estate? It's, it's a different issue, and it's not for today. I mean, the case, law, the case law says no. That, well, the, that, right. The that one, you wouldn't win on that. Yes, sir. There are, well, there are some cases out there, I agree, that say um, that the alimony terminates as a matter of law uh, upon death, period, whether you comment about it or not. There has to be an agreement for the estate to be bound to continue paying. That, well, that's yes, what sir. the cases say. Yes, sir. And that, that is an issue that was not addressed by the Taylor case. It's really the, the, the same legal issue to some extent. Um, but again, it's not before the court at this point. Um, I, I don't think that uh, any of the case law related to that is at all relevant to this issue unless you decide that the Taylor case, you know, is not the law that should be followed here because we're dealing with non-modifiable and what effect that has on, on, uh, on, on remarriage. So I, I don't know what the answer eventually will be to that, and I'm sure the first district's going to have to deal with it uh, as well. But there is no more logic to non-modifiable, meaning non-changeable, and the right of parties to reach agreements and how this appears on its face and the overall logic behind this agreement. Mr. Maris, you're approaching your 15-minute mark. Oh, I am. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, let me comment then on the, I'll do the rest of it on rebuttal. Very quickly, the set-off of the attorney's fees against 
um, the overpayment of alimony. There is no conceivable legal or factual basis for the judge's order on that. All that does is specifically make Peter Maros pay fees that he has earned, that he was awarded, based on Florida Statute 6116, need and ability to pay, repay $18,500 worth of alimony. The cases that are cited, if you read them carefully, every one of them is totally distinguishable. There is no case that would ever allow legally a judge to set off money that has been earned against an alimony overpayment. Otherwise, if you're, if you're um, uh, representing somebody who's contesting a child support or alimony modification, you've got a chance that you're not going to get paid. You're going to have to disgorge your fees if you lose. Because if they have no money to pay, as I said in the case involving the prenup, all you're basically doing is saying uh, this person uh, can't have an attorney because they're, the money isn't going to be ever going to be paid back. I know I've taken my time. I'll address it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm here today on behalf of the appellee, Peter Herbst, who um, is the former husband in this matter. I'll jump right into some of the issues that the court has raised this morning. First, Judge Morris, you asked about the cases, suggesting that the provision should have gone farther. And absolutely, as stated in the answer brief filed on behalf of Mr. Herbst, that's absolutely what's required under the law. And this particular provision doesn't even have the word remarry, remarriage, and being silent doesn't meet the burden under the law. And here's why. The purpose of permanent periodic alimony is for support. The reason that the law's default position is that it terminates upon death or remarriage is because the law is assuming that that support obligation is no longer there when the spouse remarries. That's why we have this default setting and why you have to expressly contract around it. So, it is absolutely not enough what we have in our provision. Uh, Judge Silverman, you had talked about um, alimony termination under certain circumstances, and we talked extensively <coughs> about the Taylor case. Here's something really important about the Taylor case, very important. It matters a lot that the Taylor case is about bridge the gap alimony, and here's why. Currently under the statute, both bridge the gap alimony and permanent alimony do terminate upon death or remarriage. This dissolution occurred before then, and before then, as stated by this court in 2003, the Athi case, bridge the gap alimony did not terminate upon remarriage, unlike permanent periodic alimony that for 40 plus years has always terminated upon remarriage. It's a different default setting. So why does that matter now, now that we have a statute in play? Well, in the Taylor case, that makes, it makes sense that this terminates upon remarriage if you have permanent alimony, because remember, we're talking about support, and the idea is support, and we no longer have that need unless we've contracted around it if the party remarries. Bridge the gap alimony has the opposite purpose. It is actually expressly stated that it is for a party capable of self-support. It has nothing to do with support. It has everything to do with just transitioning from being married, I mean, from being, yes, from being married to being single. So it has none of those public policy bases. As a result, then, it would be normal to require that extra step to require express contracting around remarriage being the default, I mean, remarriage resulting in um, termination of permanent alimony versus bridge the gap alimony, which has always not been terminable at all upon remarriage, kind of akin to, say, lump sum equitable distribution. Um, other courts have referred to it almost as a type of rehabilitative alimony. So you're talking about apples and oranges, the policy reasons behind it, why historically, in, you know, the legislature has now made a change, but why it would, remarriage would um, have a different effect on it. And in the Taylor case, by the way, the husband hadn't paid up that alimony. So although the wife remarries, it's not as if she remarried and then under the statute she'd been paid her alimony all along, her bridge the gap alimony all along, and then suddenly the party sought to terminate it because she got remarried. She'd only been paid a couple hundred dollars of the thousands of dollars that she was owed in that case. So she already had a right to that alimony um, when she got remarried. So that's a separate side issue going on in that case. But ultimately, I agree. Does the first district talk about the um, enforcement of the contract in that case 
and that being the reason for its ruling? Yes, it does. And in that case, though, what do they have that we don't have? They have an unambiguous provision, which we don't have. And although, in response to your question, Judge Sleet, Mr. Maros just represented that it was not ambiguous, but you asked about parole evidence, and he said that was okay. Well, we'd only be taking parole evidence if it were ambiguous. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, the-, the Do you agree the court didn't rule on that uh, aspect I, of the I case? do agree with you. I think what happened, my interpretation of what occurred is Judge Ramsberger said, this is ambiguous. I need parole evidence on intent. So then months later, he has an evidentiary hearing on intent. And then after the evidentiary <laughs> hearing, when he terminates alimony, he really doesn't do it based on anything he heard at the hearing. He does it based on all the principles outlined in the answer brief, ultimately, about what this provision, just under Florida law, needed to say to show that it, the parties intended it to go beyond the receiving spouse's remarriage. Having said that, though, Your Honor, there is record evidence. If Judge Ramsberger had chosen, he could have relied on competent substantial evidence anyway and said and supported Peter Herbst's um, position that in fact it, that it was not intended to go beyond remarriage. And what testimony is that? Was either party giving great testimony? No, as you pointed out. But what is there? He does testify. He doesn't testify just that the um, remarriage, uh, the alimony terminated upon remarriage. He thought it terminated upon cohabitation. It turns out he's probably perhaps wrong under the law, but in terms of what he thought when he signed the agreement, he testified to that. It's all at pages 706 and 707 of the record, pages 683, 684 of the record, and he testified that he understood that uh, he was paying it to get his wife on his feet, to have a viable co-parent for his children. Meanwhile, the wife testified that the sole purpose was for support, which again, the purpose of support she testified that the basis for the alimony is exactly what the public policy reason is, which is what disappears upon her remarriage. And then there is the acknowledged concealment of the remarriage that could arguably be evidence of her knowledge that it was not supposed to go on past remarriage. So although this court doesn't need to it get could, there. That could be evidence of a lot of things. I'm not this sure is true. That, this that is true, Your Honor. This is true. But the bottom line is this. It could be this court can affirm based on basic legal principles and Florida law, family law principles. This court could affirm on the evidence that is in the record related to the evidence adduced following the finding of ambiguity and the provision is ambiguous. I mean, really the parties have acknowledged that. There are a variety of bases um, as to why this court could affirm. On the fees issue, Your Honor. Well, the first DCA's analysis turns on a plain meaning of the phraseology. And I, I think you'd be hard pressed to argue to many lawyers, judges, or public members that life doesn't mean what it says. You know, I'm gonna pay you this amount of money for the rest of your life, period. And I understand what the statute says, the first DCA's analysis, I understand you wanna distinguish it, but their legal, uh, the logic they present is, it says what it means, the statute says something different, the statute doesn't trump what is expressed in the document. And so uh, I haven't really heard a good argument why the, sure, the document Honor. doesn't mean what it says. Uh, you We've get it got for the years, rest of your life. I'm sorry. We've got well, two reasons. One has to do with the provision itself in this case, which you alluded to earlier, and the other has to do with non-modification versus non-termination. Actually, the courts have treated them differently. The statute itself treats them differently. And respectfully, to the extent the first TCA, because it, it, it's clearly implied from the ruling, but it's not outright stated, and it's not clear that that was what was briefed or anything um, in that case, the non-modifiability versus non-terminability issue, but this court has treated them separately. Cited in our brief, the Pipitone case analyzes modification, and then it analyzes termination when looking at an uh, alimony issue. In the Green case, cited in the brief. This court talks about how in that referring to a petition for modification for termination says we'll go ahead and look at modification as well because we think that the relief sought in that motion was broad enough to encompass both, certainly implying we have two different things. And the statute itself in 68 point, I think 61.08, eight says termination or modification of alimony. So there are a number of instances over a number of years, including coming out of this court, suggesting that non-modification and non-termination, modification and termination rather, are not the same thing. And to the extent that that is what the first DCA meant, 
because it certainly is implied, although it's not discussed outright, this court on its own history can find that non-modification and non-termination are not the same thing. And to the provision, I mean, that they are this, not the same thing. And to the extent that we were asking about the provision, what does the provision say? Is it really clear that this provision says that we're paying alimony for the life of the, of the wife? Because it says it's for the life of the petitioner. But what does petitioner mean in that sentence? Petitioner, at the beginning of the sentence, everyone agrees petitioner means the wife, but everyone agrees it meant to say the husband pays the wife, not the wife pay the husband. So is the same Scrivener's error present at the end? Is it supposed to be for the life of the husband, which would certainly be in, would comport with standard Florida law, that he, because uh, permanent alimony terminates upon death of either party, typically, does it mean for the life of the wife? Because as you pointed out, Judge Silverman, under the law, then that would be insufficient. It can't mean that unless if, if he were to die first, it would have to say it was binding his estate if that's what it intended. The point being we're back now at that messy alimony provision that is not clear. It is not clear based on the other ambiguities and the agreement by the parties of what it meant that it even actually says that we are paying, that the husband is paying the wife for her life. Whose life are we even talking about in this provision? Which is why, back to the core of this case, that's why we have all of this law for all of these years on permanent periodic alimony and why the public policy is what it is and why people need to expressly state what their intentions are because of problems like we have that exist right here. And in fact, what is non-modifiable? What do people usually think that means? In the family law world, they usually think it means the amount. I can't come back and ask for a different amount or whatever. I mean, that's what really we're talking about. That's why this court, that's why the statute treats modification and termination differently. So ultimately, Your Honor, I, I hope that I've answered your question, but that would be my response on that issue. If there are any, are there any other questions on the alimony issue? If not, I'd be happy to move to the fees issue and ask the court if there are any questions on that issue. I'm inclined to rest primarily on the brief on, on the uh, fees issue because the bottom line is all of the, none of the arguments by the appellant on the fees issue di are directed at any of the cases cited. And there are cases, including coming out of this court, setting off attorney's fee award against alimony overpayment awards. There's a public policy argument that this flies in the face of public policy, but the nature and existence of these cases shows that it doesn't fly in the face of public policy, and again loses sight of the fact that we have a remarried spouse receiving support. So unless the court has any additional questions on the fee issue. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you so much. Mr. Morris. About four minutes, Your Honor. Yes. Um, a couple of things, Your Honor. Again, it's some, there's some benefit to being involved at the trial level, but uh, this argument that petitioner um, payable for the life of the petitioner uh, in the agreement means the husband is nonsense, not in any way a part of the record, not in any way a part of an argument, not in any way the part of anything that was raised before the trial court. The agreement says $4,500 from the petitioner to the respondent, that was a mistake and everybody acknowledges it was a mistake. The petitioner is the petitioner. The second petitioner is the wife. There's no doubt. That was never brought up before the trial court ever. It's never been something that has been litigated, never been anything that's been testified on. You don't take a mistake and there how somehow make the rest of the agreement ambiguous. That just isn't the case. This is alimony payable $4,500 a month for the life of the petitioner who is only the wife. To now argue before this court that that meant for the life of the husband is absolutely not before the court, never was before the trial court, and is just wrong. Yeah, but can we consider the mistake in draftsmanship? Can we apply that analysis to the fact that there's no reference to termination at all? We have, mis it's wrought with mistakes here. Then there's no reference to termination at all in this agreement. Does it really reflect their intentions? Or it, not? it makes no difference at all, Your Honor, whether there were drafting <coughs> errors or mistakes in the agreement, except to the extent that it caused a problem. And there were no problems here from the, for the legal issue whatsoever. There's no doubt that petitioner, I mean, that, hu that the husband was supposed to pay the wife and that it was for life of petitioner. That's the only issue before the court. Now, does that raise some kind of an ambiguity? No. Does it, uh, does it have something to do with whether or not non-modifiable for the life of the petitioner means non-terminable? Honestly, no. 
because, I mean, I, once again, that's a drafting deal. But what, what that issue comes down to is the very simple uh, issue of, as stated by Taylor, does the statute control or does the agreement control? And there is no case, never has been a case in Florida ever, despite uh, counsel's argument, that there's some distinction drawn between termination and modification related to this issue. That just isn't the case. There's cases uh, it's that- not related to this case, but that issue keeps coming up. I mean, you've seen it in the case law, and it, it keeps coming up. And there is a distinction in the case law, and the statute seems to recognize there is a difference between modification and termination. Well, well what she's talking about is there's, it's, there's, there's nothing where this court has said that, any court in the state has said that non-modification doesn't mean non-termination, or it does. None of those, they talk about drafting, but there, unless I've missed it and it's not in any of the briefs, not been argued before the court, there's never been a case that says non-modification does not mean non-termination. That's if, if I'm being clear on that. And well, that's specific. And in, in your case, this agreement also has before it continuing for life, so you, I think you have that additional argument to make um, that clearly modification in this case means for life or non-modification means for life. So, yeah, I actually am... As I re I have the clause in front of me, I keep reading it and marking it and reading it and listening and marking it, and I'm really, frankly, come to the point where I'm having trouble why this is ambiguous. It is not ambiguous at all. And, and as I said earlier, Judge Ramsberger did not find that ambiguous. He found he was worried in the Porter case, again, he didn't have Taylor. The, the, they, the, the concurring opinion talked about, is this a property settlement? that would be non-modifiable, or is it support alimony? And he thought more testimony might be needed on that, but that never became an issue in the case. It's definitely support alimony. Council will concede that. There's never been an issue. And then the last thing on, on this, Your Honor, very, very important, is that um, you can't create a question of fact and argue that this is an issue of fact that the trial judge ruled on by claiming some kind of misunderstanding of the law. Uh, saying that I thought alimony terminated, that's not a question of fact. That's nothing the judge uh, ruled on whatsoever in this case. This is a black and white, de novo, legal issue. You all are either going to agree with Taylor or you're not, and, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Next case is Harley versus Procacci.